The year is 1934. Soviet engineers unveil the AA-20, a locomotive boasting 4,000 horsepower and a wheel arrangement so extreme, Russian train Western experts privately questioned if their railways could handle such force. On paper, it promised to haul 3,500 tons across 700 kilometers, a figure that outpaced anything in the West. But rumors circled about impossible demands placed on Soviet steel and coal. What drove this audacious gamble? And why did its legend outlive its reality? The answer begins with blueprints that defied common sense. The AA-20's blueprints read like a challenge to the laws of locomotive engineering. At the heart of the machine, a boiler rated for 17 kilograms per square centimeter, far above most Soviet contemporaries, pressed steam into action. The heating surface stretched to 445 square meters, a figure that dwarfed even the largest American freight types of the era. Yet it was the wheelbase that drew gasps from anyone with a background in rail design, a 414-4 arrangement meaning four leading wheels, 14 driving wheels, and four trailing wheels, with seven coupled axles in a single rigid frame. No other European locomotive had attempted such a stretch. The driving wheels alone spanned over 10 meters, forcing engineers to make the middle axles flangeless and add lateral motion to the outer pairs just to navigate standard curves. The firebox wedged between those seven axles started with a 10 square meter grate in the early design, but was later expanded to 12. This was not just a nod to brute force. The designers knew Soviet coal ran low in quality and high in ash so they gambled on more surface area to keep the fire burning hot. The boiler's diameter was pushed to the limit, but its length was hemmed in by the wheelbase, resulting in a short, wide barrel packed with tubes. Every element was oversized, from the steam dome to the superheater, which borrowed from the Chusov system to wring out every last calorie from the fuel. The entire locomotive, with tender, weighed in at over 330 metric tons. Each driving axle bore a load of 20 tons, the maximum Soviet rails could withstand without risking deformation. The sheer mass and length forced a rethink of track layouts and bridge tolerances wherever the AA-20 was meant to run. This was not refinement, it was engineering by escalation. Every measurement, every angle, was calculated to maximize raw hauling power, even if it meant pushing infrastructure and physics to the breaking point. Plans for the AA-20 did not stop at a single prototype. In the early 1930s, Soviet planners circulated proposals that read like declarations of industrial war, a locomotive capable of producing 4,000 horsepower, hauling 3,500 tons at 70 kilometers per hour, and covering 700 kilometers without refueling. These numbers, stamped on factory memos and circulated among railway directors, seemed almost reckless to Western observers. For context, the most powerful American freight locomotives of the era rarely exceeded 3,000 horsepower and struggled to move 2,500 tons at anything approaching those speeds. The AA-20's projected output was not a gentle step forward. It was a leap that threatened to rewrite the very limits of rail transport. The scale of ambition went further. Internal Soviet documents discussed the possibility of a fleet. Not one, not ten, but up to 300 of these monsters. Each one a rolling factory of steel and steam. In theory, such a force could shift the balance of logistics across the Eurasian landmass. A single AA-20, on paper, could pull more than an entire Western freight consist and do it over distances that would leave most rivals cooling off in the yard. If realized, a fleet of 300 would have meant a fundamental change to Soviet freight capacity, enough to move entire industries, armies, or resource flows at a pace Western planners could barely imagine. This vision was not just about horsepower or tonnage. It was a statement of intent. The Soviet Union would build not for comfort, but for dominance. Factories at Voroshilovgrad and beyond 
were already being tasked with retooling for heavy components, new steel grades, and oversized tenders. The AA-20 was never meant to be a showpiece. It was conceived as the backbone of a new industrial order, its projected numbers a direct challenge to the world's understanding of what a locomotive and a centrally planned economy could achieve. NATO logistics analysts, staring at the published figures for the AA-20, ran the numbers with a sense of disbelief. On paper, this locomotive could haul a load that dwarfed standard Western trains. The calculations were not abstract. They translated raw tonnage into military hardware and men. 45 T-54 tanks, each weighing over 35 tons, could be moved in a single train behind one AA-20. That is the backbone of an armored regiment, not just a column of freight cars. Or, if troop movement was the priority, the same train could carry 10,000 fully equipped soldiers, complete with support vehicles and supplies. For planners accustomed to moving battalions and stages, this capacity forced a rethink of what Soviet rail power meant. Where a typical Western Express might stretch to 1,500 tons, the projected limit of the AA-20 was more than double. It promised to do this at 70 kilometers per hour, fast enough to keep up with mechanized deployments. The numbers suggested a single locomotive could shift the balance of an entire campaign, compressing what would normally take several trains and multiple days into a single overnight operation. The math did not stop at headline figures. Analysts charted how many AA-20s it would take to move a division worth of armor from the Donbass to the western frontier in less than 48 hours. Every calculation fed the same conclusion. If these engines existed in quantity, the Soviets could mass forces or supplies at a speed Western infrastructure simply could not match. For the first time, the threat was measured not in abstract horsepower, but in tanks and troops arriving where they were not supposed to be. Every extra ton of power on the AA-20 came with a price. Soviet planners, eager to outmuscle Western rivals, accepted a staggering 40% penalty in fuel consumption compared to the best American heavy freight engines of the day. For every kilometer traveled, the AA-20 burned through Soviet coal at a rate that would have sent Western accountants into a panic. The locomotive's oversized boiler and firebox demanded constant feeding, especially when running on the low-grade, high-ash coal available across the Soviet Union. In practice, keeping the fire hot enough to meet its theoretical output proved nearly impossible without overwhelming the crew and draining resources. Western engineers, looking at the numbers, drew sharp comparisons to the Union Pacific 9000 series, a three-cylinder 412 American giant, known for its efficiency on premium fuel. The Union Pacific 9000 could deliver similar tractive effort with about 20% less raw pulling power than the AA-20, yet it managed this with far better fuel economy and less stress on rails. The American design used a wide firebox and a carefully balanced steam circuit, allowing for more even burning and smoother operation. In contrast, the AA-20's narrow elongated firebox and short boiler barrel forced compromises that left it gasping for steam when pushed hard. Inside Soviet ministries, the debate was fierce. Was the raw hauling power worth the cost in coal, labor, and track wear? Every ton of freight moved by the AA-20 meant more fuel trains, more ash to clear, and more money spent keeping the monster running. The numbers painted a clear picture. The Soviet approach delivered brute force, but Western designs achieved nearly as much with far greater efficiency. As the AA-20's true appetite became clear, the cost of power began to overshadow its promise. Firemen assigned to the AA-20 faced a task that bordered on the impossible. The locomotive's firebox, stretched to 12 square meters, demanded a constant avalanche of coal, just to keep the boiler pressure from dropping. Soviet coal, notoriously low in calorific value and loaded with ash, burned sluggishly compared to the premium grades used in Western engines. Shoveling ton after ton onto the long, narrow grate, crews found themselves fighting not just the fire, but the design itself. 
The geometry of the firebox, forced by the seven coupled axles beneath, meant heat and air rarely distributed evenly. Pockets of glowing embers would flare at the rear, while the front of the grate could starve for oxygen, producing thick smoke and wasted fuel. Ash built up fast, choking the air passages and forcing firemen to rake and clear the grates while the engine was still running. Every few kilometers, the fire would lose its edge, steam pressure would sag, and the AA-20 would begin to lag. Even with the grate enlarged from 10 to 12 square meters, the problem only grew worse under real-world conditions. The numbers looked impressive on paper, but in the cab, the story was different. No matter how hard the crew worked, the boiler simply could not keep up when asked to deliver its rated output over long distances. Other Soviet heavy freight locomotives, like the FD class, had gone through years of testing to find the right balance between firebox size, heating surface, and drafting for the available coal. The AA-20, by contrast, was a leap in scale without a matching leap in combustion science. The result was a machine that was always on the edge of steam starvation. Operators reported that the engine could barely make its advertised speeds when hauling heavy loads, and any attempt to push harder led to clouds of black smoke and a rapid drop in boiler pressure. For the men on the footplate, the AA-20's greatest enemy was not the rails beneath, it was the fire inside. Track engineers at Voroshilovgrad watched the AA-20's first trial runs with a mixture of AOE and anxiety. The locomotive's seven coupled axles locked together in a rigid frame, and they stretched the definition of what Soviet rails could bear. On straight sections, the engine moved with the ponderous authority of a battleship, but every curve exposed a fundamental flaw. The frame resisted bending and forced the rails to flex instead. Switches groaned under the pressure, and standard 60-kilogram rails showed visible deformation after just a few passes. Maintenance crews reported that rail fastenings loosened, ties shifted, and points warped after the AA-20's demonstration runs. The middle driving axles, stripped of flanges to help with curve negotiation, only partly solved the problem. Lateral motion devices on the outer axles added complexity, but did not save the track from spreading under the 20-ton axle load. On tight curves, the rigid wheelbase forced the locomotive to ride up, threatening derailment and damaging the very infrastructure it was meant to serve. Depot staff quickly realized that keeping the AA-20 operational was a job for specialists. Routine turnarounds became marathons. The running gear, with its intricate system of rods and bearings stretched across seven axles, demanded constant attention. Lubrication points multiplied, and the risk of uneven wear or misalignment grew with every kilometer. Even minor track imperfections sent vibrations through the frame, loosening bolts and stressing the suspension. Replacement parts custom fabricated for this single engine piled up in storerooms. Every inspection revealed fresh cracks in the frame or signs of metal fatigue near the axle boxes. The sheer scale of the locomotive made routine maintenance a logistical headache, tying up skilled crews and specialized equipment for days. By 1935, the verdict was clear. Reports from regional railway managers documented mounting track damage, rising repair costs, and the impracticality of deploying the AA-20 on standard lines. The Ministry of Railways faced a decision, invest in a massive overhaul of the Soviet rail network or abandon the experiment. The answer came swiftly. Plans for additional units were shelved, and the AA-20 remained a unique specimen, too large for its own good, and too destructive for the rails it was meant to conquer. The prototype was quietly withdrawn, its promise undone by the very might that had inspired its creation. In the spring of 1958, the NATO logistics cell in Brussels received a classified Soviet railways report that sent a ripple through Western defense ministries. The document, circulated among senior analysts, described a theoretical scenario. A fleet of ultra-heavy locomotives, each capable of hauling military hardware and supplies across the breadth of the Soviet Union, without pause. The numbers, drawn from Soviet planning memos, 
assumed a hundred such engines in service, enough to move the equivalent of a division overnight from the interior to the European frontier. One line in the report had been hastily translated and underlined in red pencil. It read simply that a division overnight is no longer a fantasy. This phrase, repeated in briefing rooms from London to Washington, was not a direct quote from any known Soviet order, but an analyst's summary of the logistical implications. The idea was stark. With a hundred engines of this size, the Soviets could shift entire armored formations in a single night, compressing what Western planners considered a week's worth of rail traffic into a single synchronized surge. The memo did not name the AA-20 directly, but its specifications matched the locomotive's published figures. A 20-ton axle load, tractive effort beyond 70,000 pounds, and the capacity to pull more than 3,000 tons at speed. The Western response was immediate. Policy advisors flagged the scenario as a potential game-changer for NATO's forward defense planning. If the Soviets could deploy such a fleet, the balance of power along the Iron Curtain would tilt overnight, not through new weapons, but through the brute force of rail logistics. The phrase a division overnight became shorthand for a new kind of threat, one measured not in missiles or tanks, but in the ability to deliver them anywhere at any time by rail. In 1967, the last trace of the AA-20 vanished from the Soviet rail landscape. After years spent idle in a Voroshilovgrad depot, the locomotive was quietly dismantled and sold for scrap. No ceremony marked its end. Official records list only the withdrawal and the weight of metal reclaimed a footnote for a machine once meant to reshape an entire industry. Yet the AA-20 refused to disappear entirely. In the decades since, rumors have circulated among rail enthusiasts and historians. Some claim a section of its frame survived in a remote workshop, or that a single driving wheel was preserved as a relic. Others insist the locomotive was simply cut up and melted down, its parts indistinguishable from any other Soviet steel by the end of the 1960s. The myth of the AA-20 has grown in the absence of hard evidence. Every few years, new claims surface, a faded photograph, a supposed eyewitness account, a scrap of metal said to bear the original builder's stamp. But no museum displays the AA-20's number plate, and no official registry lists it among preserved Soviet locomotives. The Rand Corporation's classified studies from the Cold War mention the AA-20 only in passing, as an example of Soviet overreach, an experiment that proved the limits of gigantism, not its promise. What remains is a legend, a machine built to terrify, now lost to time, leaving behind only questions and the faint echo of ambition on rails. Today, the myth of unstoppable power still shapes how nations pursue technology, often at the cost of sustainability and truth. As new global rivalries fuel bold engineering feats, the real question is not who builds the biggest machine, but who learns from failure. Ambition without reflection risks repeating old mistakes. In the race for progress, it is not force that endures. It is wisdom. What drives innovation in your world? Let us talk in the comments.